morning and welcome to First Baptist Church here in Watertown. We are blessed to have you join us here this morning. A special uh, welcome to all the moms out there. We'll say happy Mother's Day to all you moms who are joining us this morning. Also just wanted to add that if uh, there is anything that you would need, please reach out to the church office or to Pastor Shane or myself so we can make sure that we meet any of those needs that you may have. Uh, just an update on the special benevolent offering that was taken this last week. Just wanted to let you know that over $1,200 has been given to be shared between the Watertown Food Pantry and the Shared Community Mission Group. Both of these local ministries are serving those in need here in Watertown. Now the purpose of these gifts is to partner with these local organizations showing the love of Christ to those in need in our community with the hope that in the future we can provide a platform to provide the gospel to them at a later date. We praise Jesus for his provision. Now with that, let us prepare our hearts for worship. Our call to worship this morning comes from 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 through 6. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. So Heavenly Father, we do come to you this morning. We ask that you will meet us here. We thank you for the gift of Christ. We thank you for the cross. Thank you, Jesus, that you suffered and you died on that cross for the sin of all men. So we come here this morning to lift our praises to you, to worship you, open our hearts and our minds to receive all that you have for us this morning. And we pray all these things in your precious and holy name, Jesus. Amen. Let's all sing together our first song, Stronger. Thank you. 
Our scripture reading of confession this morning comes from Psalm 32, where David writes, Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Selah. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Selah. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayers to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. So as we read this psalm on confession, we see the pain and turmoil that David experienced when he kept his sin within him, when he did not go to the Lord for forgiveness, but when he acknowledged his sin, when he refused to cover his iniquity, notice the, the promise given that you forgave the iniquity of my sin. So as you go to the Lord in confession this morning, keep in mind these words that those who repent of their sins and trust in Christ receive forgiveness by his blood. So go to the Lord now and confess your sins. Oh Lord, you know our hearts. You know how often we fail. We know You know that we are often tempted to cover our sins and hide them from you. But we cannot hide our transgressions before you. There is nothing that is hidden from your sight. Lord, you know us inside and out. You know us better than we know ourselves. Give us the honesty to be able to confess our sins before you and receive the pardon that you offer. We long for that blessedness that you promised in this verse, uh, against whom you do not count iniquity. We ask that you would not count our sins against us, but that you would forgive us in Christ. We ask for all of the sins of our congregation, that you would forgive us, that you would cause us to know you, and that you would cause us to walk in your ways. We cannot hide from you, and yet so we ask for your forgiveness. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church. We are so delighted that you could join us this morning or whatever time it is that you're able to, to listen to this service as we continue on in our series on the book of Job. And so let's bow our heads and pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, O oh God, we, we come before you and we come before you now. And Lord, what we pray is that you would teach us to be compassionate and kind to others. Lord, that you would help us to see through the suffering and to see you as a loving father. And God, also that you would please help us to hope in Jesus Christ. We thank you so much, our God, that we are not alone in our community. We pray for Cornerstone Church. We pray that you'd please be with our brother Aaron as he is preaching. We ask, Lord, that many would be saved through his efforts. We pray, Lord, that you would please heal his wife. And God, we ask that you would just give him great wisdom and insight into your word and for the care of the people that you have gathered at Cornerstone Church. We pray for our, our governor, Governor Evers. We ask, Lord, that if he is not saved, that he might come to know you. We pray, God, please, that he would gather around himself people who will speak the truth to him in love and that he might come to know you if he does not know you, but, Lord, that he would also be wise and prudent as he responds to the COVID-19 pandemic. And God, we also ask that on the last day that he would be able to stand before you clad in your righteousness. And Lord, we pray for our three missionaries. We ask that you'd please be with them and bless them, keep them. And Lord, we just think of the, the muses in Australia and the Joneses in Brazil and our brother Mike Rudolph, and we ask that you would bless all three of them in their work. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Adolf Hitler had a half-sister by the name of Paula. He referred to her as a stupid goose. She never joined the Nazi party. She never married and was a maid at a Jewish school before World War II and then a secretary at a military hospital during the war. Adolf Hitler took care of her financially until his death, provided security arrangements for her, and, and seems to have been very fond of her. He, he never attempted to draw her into his inner circle. She and she was never able to bring herself to believe that Hitler was the cause of the Jewish Holocaust. She lived quietly and without much fanfare and died in 1960. She was a simple German peasant. But Paula was one of the few people in the entire world that had a natural and innocent affection for Adolf Hitler. He was her half-brother, and besides sort of normal sibling fights, he was very kind to her and cared for her. Imagine with me for a moment being on a really long car ride with Paula, and that the thing that you do during that entire car ride is to try to convince her that Adolf Hitler was necessarily in hell, that in fact her brother was one of the greatest villains of all of world history, and that she should rejoice that he was dead and burning. To try to push Paula to do such a thing and to believe such a thing would be cruel and pointless. It wouldn't help her to come to know Jesus Christ. It would simply be a wicked thing to do. Yet here's the point where Christians need to be thoughtful. Sometimes when we're sharing the gospel and confronting others with their sin, or just when we're talking idly, we are enormously cruel. We can present the gospel in such a way that it's a club to hit people with rather than a way to salvation. And so let's turn in our Bibles to Job chapter 8. Job chapter 8, where Bildad the Shuhite exhibits this callous indifference that we should be thinking about. And our outline this morning, in case you're taking notes, is don't be self-satisfied and cruel. Don't be self-satisfied and cruel. Spy out the chill of dark providences, or ready yourself for the chill of dark providences, and accept Job's future hope. Now, as you're turning to Job chapter 8, I want you to remember that Job's children have been crushed in the collapse of a house. Satan has turned Job's friends and even his family against him, and Job is covered in terrible sores. He's just argued with one of his friends, and now he is to be ravaged by Bildad. So let's look into Job chapter 8, verses 1 to 7. Job chapter 8, verses 1 to 7. Then Bildad, the Shuhite, answered and said, How long will you say these things? 
and the words of your mouth be a great wind? Does God pervert justice, or does the Almighty pervert the right? If your children have sinned against him, he has delivered them into the hands of their transgression. If you will seek God and plead with the Almighty for mercy, if you are pure and upright, surely then he will arouse himself for you and restore your rightful habitation. And through your, though your beginning was small, your latter days will be very great. Now the Bible gives us good examples and bad examples. And the way that we are to discern which that we have before us, whether or not we have a good example or a bad example, is through other parts of the Bible and through the two great commandments, which is love God with all of your being and love your neighbor as yourself. And it should be readily apparent that Bildad is a bad example in what he's saying about Job and in a portion of his understanding of salvation. Now, again, what we have to be very careful here is because Bildad also says some things that are true and beautiful. So glance with me for a moment to verses 13 through 15. Such are the paths of all who forget God. The hope of the godless shall perish. His confidence is severed and his trust is a spider's web. He leans against his house, but it does not stand. He lays hold of it, but it does not endure. So Bildad is speaking with artistic care and thought, but he's also cruel and self-satisfied. It's, it's not that he isn't saying beautiful things, but he's, he's using beautiful things to harm and to hurt his friend Job. His basic message to Job is, your children were notorious sinners, perhaps secretly, but they were certainly sinners, and they are in hell for their sins. God has destroyed them because they were so wicked that God could not bear them even being in this world. And then the implication is, is that while you are a sinner, your sins must not have been just quite as bad as your children. So verse 5, if you will seek God and plead with the Almighty for mercy. So his argument to Job is that your children are dead, your children are in hell, they were horrible, horrible sinners. You yourself are a terrible sinner, but not quite as bad as your children. And if you repent, God will then restore to you all of your health and your wealth. We know from the opening chapters of Job, Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2, that that Job knew that his children were sinners. And this is why he trained them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. This is why he led them in worship and in repentance and sacrifice. Yet even though he knew that his children were sinners, it is the hope of every believer that their loved ones are saved. And Bildad, with incredible smugness, damns people that Job loves to hell. Christians, please be careful here. The more we love someone, the more that we desire to hope that they are saved. And given our relationship with them, it's natural to desire their eternal prosperity. Listen to what Jesus says in discussing the tragic death of of several people. Those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you all likewise will perish. So when Jesus is confronted with a tragic death and even suffering, he he tells his audience what the purpose of the suffering was, and that purpose was you repent and you all or you all likewise will perish. Notice he doesn't exclude the possibility that his audience hasn't already repented. He doesn't exclude the possibility that those who were crushed by the tower had repented. But he does inform his audience of of their need to repent. Part of the reason that God sends tragedies into our lives is to remind us to get right with God. But it's not godly to casually damn people's loved ones to hell by personal fiat. The Bible reveals how people are saved, but not who is saved. And and Christian friends, this is, again, so important. The Bible tells us how to get saved, but it doesn't tell us who is saved. Now, the biblical attitude is portrayed by Dr. Moeller many years ago on Larry King Live in an interview. Larry King asked Dr. Moeller, who is the president of, of Southern Baptist Seminary, if Roman Catholics were going to hell. And Moeller responded, allow me to be very clear. Southern Baptists who do not repent of their sins and trust in Jesus Christ go to hell. 
So loving our neighbor includes extending the hope of salvation to all who repent and believe in Jesus Christ. The Bible is clear about Jesus. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by, by which we must be saved. And Christian friends, what we're supposed to do with tragedies is to leverage that tragedy to provide hope in Christ. We're not supposed to use tragedies to extend the despair of hell. Our job is to extend the gospel. Now let's take a look and see how it is that Bildad can be so self-complacent. The, the basic background issue as to why Bildad can be this way is because Bildad's children haven't died tragically, and he's secure and wealthy enough to spend seven to eight days berating Job. We see Bildad's understanding in his illustration of righteousness and wickedness. So this is chapter 8, verses 16 and 18. He is a lush plant before the sun, and his shoots spread over his garden. His roots intertwine the stone heap. He, he looks upon a house of stones. If he is destroyed from his place, then it will deny him, saying, I have never seen you. In, in Bildad's estimation of things, righteousness is essentially shown and proven by prosperity. Bildad knows that he is righteous because he's prosperous, just as he knows that good farmland, when properly watered, brings forth a harvest. So salvation in his mind is, is organic and predictable as the change of seasons. If you have a good crop, if you're doing well, if you have lots of animals, you have lots of healthy children, you yourself are healthy, then you're righteous. And because Bildad is confident that he has prosperity and it proves that he understands and knows and loves God, he then moves on and he approaches history in a lazy manner. He, he's not actually as engaged in wisdom in the way and in the depth that he thinks he is because he's so short-sighted. Look with me to chapter 8, verse 8. For inquire, please, of bygone ages, and consider what the fathers have searched out. And, and so what he's saying is that the great tradition, the, this great observation of history and revelation shows that what I am teaching you is true. And when he glances back over moral history of the world, what he finds is that good things happen to good people. And bad things happen to bad people. Except for that's not true. The problem is the following examples. Remember godly Abel, who was murdered by his brother Cain. Well, what did Cain do? Cain is miraculously guarded by God for the rest of his life from murder. He establishes a city, a people, and had a son. The wicked Ham was saved from the flood, and through him his children founded Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. The entire nation of Israel suffered in bondage in Egypt and their sons were murdered by the Pharaoh. History does not teach the lesson that Bildad claims. The bygone ages actually teaches this truth from Ecclesiastes 7.15. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness and there is a wicked man who prolongs his life in his evil doing. When I just glance back over modern history, I think one of the great embarrassments of, of the last century was that Pol Bahat, who murdered a quarter of the population of Cambodia, died in bed at age 73. We can look further back into history and we can see the godly King Edward VI, he died at age 15 in horrible pain. And he was a godly, godly young man. Now, Bildad's confidence does not come from a close reading of history, but rather from self-righteousness. He is cruel because he trusts in his own goodness and his own pride. He's pompous. Now, my friends, our confidence cannot be in ourselves, but rather in God's mercy on sinners. And Christians are not to be cruel, self-satisfied, and vindictive. Why? Ephesians 4.32 be kind to one another, tended hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. You see, Christians are only cruel when we become self righteous. We are, we're cruel because we have become angry and pompous and self confident. 
But when we are remembering how it is we are saved, when we are remembering what it is that God had to do for us so that we could be saved, we are a humble people and a quiet people, a gentle people, a patient and compassionate people. We are able to forgive others because we know how much God has forgiven us. The foundation of kindness among believers is recognizing that we are sinners saved by grace. And we are to hope that others are saved because we know the depravity of our own hearts. We do not assume that prosperity is a sign of righteousness or that suffering is evidence of wickedness. Sometimes we have to remember the opposite is, is also true. Prosperity is not necessarily a sign of wickedness and suffering is not necessarily a sign of righteousness. We live in a world that is confused this way. Now what our father in the faith Job goes on to show us is why we mustn't be cruel and self-satisfied in our interacting with others. Job is in the crucible of suffering. Misery tends to tunnel our vision and to make us feel as if God is impersonal and even cruel. And listeners, do you do you know that? Do you, do, you, do you know, having suffered so much, that it just seems like it, it, it narrows everything down and you can't see God? You, you, you can't see all of the good gifts that God has given you because the suffering has, has narrowed down what you're experiencing. Pain causes us to, instead of feeling the loving gaze of the Father... Then God's presence and His knowledge and His sovereignty chills our souls. One wicked philosopher writes of God's eye as a cold, unblinking, always watching, never sleeping, condemning, but never loving eye that's just staring at Him. We don't want to reinforce that when we share the gospel. We don't even want to reinforce that when we attempt to convict others of sin. We as Christians want to share the hope and love of Christ. And so as Job enters his dialogue with Bildad, he almost without effort is able to falsify the claim that bad things only happen to bad people. Look with me to Job chapter 9, verses 22 to 24. It is all one. Therefore, I say, he destroys both the blameless and the wicked. When disaster brings sudden death, he mocks at the calamity of the innocent. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He covers the face of its judges. If it is not he, who then is it? God, in his sovereignty, gives us both good and misery. And by the way, when we look out at the most powerful men and women in the world, we see a nightmare of wickedness. We can think of Artaxerxes and Nebuchadnezzar and Alexander the Great. Remember, Alexander the Great is informed one day that there are more worlds than this one. And he starts weeping because he hasn't even conquered this world. Julius Caesar, Attila the Hun, Genghis Khan, Catherine the Great, and and more modern examples. These, These people with these great and huge empires are often wicked. Now, the reason for this is that God keeps his most precious gift for his people. What is God's most precious gift? A relationship with him in faith. But God also freely distributes wealth and health to the godly and to the wicked. Now, in the furnace of suffering, Job finds little comfort from God in all of his power. Because suffering suggests that God is indifferent, if not cruel. Now listen to how Job describes his experience of God's power in Job chapter 19, verses 13 to 24. God will not turn back his anger. Beneath him bowed the helpers of Rahab. How then can I answer him, choosing my words with him? Though I am in the right, I cannot answer him. I must appeal for mercy to my accuser. If I am summoned, if I summoned him and he answered me, I would not believe that he was listening to my voice, for he crushes me with a tempest and multiplies my wounds without cause. He will not let me get a breath, but fills me with bitterness. If it is a contest of strength, behold, he is mighty. If it is a matter of justice, who can summon him? Though I am in the right, my own mouth would condemn me. Though I am blameless, he would prove me perverse. I am blameless. I regard not myself. I loathe my life. It is all one. Therefore, I say he destroys both the blameless and the wicked. 
When disaster brings sudden death, he mocks at the calamity of the innocent. The earth is given into the hands of the wicked. He covers the face of the judges. If it is not he, who then is it? Job looks out into the world and he sees the sovereignty of God. He sees God's control over all things. And there is no comfort there because he feels no evidence of God's mercy. And then Job chapter 10, verses 9 to 16. This is Job pleading with God. Remember that you have made me like clay. And will you return me to the dust? Do you not pour me out? Did you not pour me out like milk and curdle me like cheese? You clothed me with skin and flesh and knit to me together with bones and sinews. You have granted life and steadfast love. Your care has preserved my soul. Yet these things you hid in your heart. I know that this was your purpose. If I sin, you watch me and do not acquit me of my iniquity. If I am guilty, woe to me. If I am right, I cannot lift up my head. For I am filled with disgrace and look on my affliction. And were my head lifted up, you would hunt me like a lion and again work wonders against me. You you renew your righteousness against me and increase your vexation towards me. You bring fresh troops against me. Why did you bring me out from the womb? Would that I have died before any eye had seen me and were as though I had not been carried from the womb to the grave. Are not my days few? Then cease and leave me alone that I may find a little cheer. Do you hear the discomfort that Job experiences because of his pain? One author describes similar pain this way. Job is someone being torn apart because he cannot deny the reality of faith nor can he reconcile it with the savage reality of life as he now experiences it. Now part of the reason that the book of Job exists is to forewarn us of the possibilities and the temptations that occur to the believer in suffering. Our love for God and trust in His mercy can be chilled by seeing Him from this perspective of the sovereign cause of pain. And we must have spied out this possibility and be prepared. We have to reconnoiter this possibility. We have to begin to plan and build a defense in our hearts against this possibility. God has given us pain to tell us what things will destroy us if increased. So as little children, we learn to be careful with hot water in the bathtub, which protects us from boiling water on the stove. And the shocking bang of the balloon safely warns us against greater explosions. The issue is is that our perception of suffering does not always speak the truth to us. So if we start dieting, our body communicates that we are starving to death. When we start a program of exercise, our bodies feel abused. And when God sends anguish into our lives, it may convey hatred rather than love. This is so much the case that Jesus Christ cries out from the cross the words of Psalm 21, 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you remember when Jesus said that on the cross? And when you remember that, do you also recall to mind that the Son had agreed to die? That angels had been sent to prepare Him for the suffering. Jesus knew that this anguish was coming, but separation from the experience of the love of God was so horrifying that Jesus was broken by it. Part of Jesus' suffering on the cross is that he no longer has a sense of God's love for him. And so he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God sends us these models and, and these pictures so that we can prepare Listen to what the brother of Jesus tells us in James chapter 5, verses 10 to 11. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. So here's the difficulty that we have with the book of Job. We 
We open up the book of Job and we see Job suffering and we go to the end of the book of Job and we discover that Job is vindicated before his friends. All of his wealth is returned to him. He sees God. All of these wonderful things happen to him. But that's not Job's experience in this passage. Job's experience in this passage is is pain. And so the reason, or part of the reason, that God has put the book of Job into the Bible is to fortify our hearts against suffering by memorizing the contours of Job. And so we are to strive to have a good conscience so that when dark providence arrives, we know that we are not being disciplined for a particular sin, and we know that this suffering will be limited, and we know that the book of Job ends with a blessing and not a curse. Now, please don't waste Job's suffering. Rather, brace yourself against suffering by using the Bible. The book of Job is designed to allow us to be armchair theologians in preparation for a battle. The, the book of Job is to be studied in, in the calm and quiet of the classroom of our life so that when we are engaged in the battle, we can anticipate the suffering and the Lord's purpose. It's to remind us that God is not slow, as some would count slowness, but our perception of God's timing is often clouded by pain. I I want you to to think on the difficulties that we've had for the last few months in in the stay-at-home order. And I just want you to imagine, in in 20 years, once COVID-19 is taken care of, and we'll we'll tell funny stories about take homeschooling our kids for the first time and and projects that we did, and and it'll be a lot of fun. It's not a lot of fun right now. But you see, we have to have God's future in front of us. So God has given us the end of Job to encourage us to stay the course so that we might see God. God. God's mercy will again be experienced by Job in the course of everyday life, but Job does not know that in our text today. Now, we as New Testament Christians have enormous advantages over Job. When Job was covered in loathsome sores, he did not have the example of the prophets but he did have a hope or desire that he describes in Job chapter 9, verses 32 to 35. Look there with me. For he is not a man as I am, that I might answer him that we should come to trial together. There is no arbitrator between us who might lay his hand on us both. Let him take his rod away from me and let not dread of him terrify me. Then I would speak without fear of him, for I am not so in myself. Now, what Job is describing here is the uncanniness and the otherness of God. God, within his divine nature, is completely foreign to us. And so God tells us things like this in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 9. For as high as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your ways. Thoughts. God's thoughts are so beyond ours that he, he barely lisps to us when he speaks to us in baby talk. Man cannot comprehend or understand God. But God is also infinitely holy. This is why we read, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And then Psalm 5, verses 5 to 6 For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors a bloodthirsty and deceitful man. Now we can say beautiful things about God. We can say that God is love. And I want you to know that that is exhaustively true. But my friends, God's love means that he also loves himself. He loves his power, his holiness, his righteousness, and his justice. When we look out into the world, we see a confounding mixture of justice and mercy and enormous kindness and terrifying destruction. The world shows us the confused states of our hearts and our lives. And sometimes when we look to God, what we see is an uncanniness. What we see is is a cold sovereignty. This is how Job describes it. There's no arbitrator between us who might lay his hand on us both. 
An arbitrator is someone who comes between two parties and makes a a binding judgment between them. And so what Job is expressing is the hope that there might be someone who can communicate with God with divine clarity. That there could be someone who, who could speak to God in a way that would comprehend God. That would be as high as his thoughts. And yet at the same time speak to and for humanity as a man. Now, I want you to listen to the incredible words of the angels on Christmas morning. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you this born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And then I want to add the incredible words of Isaiah chapter 9. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end, and on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. How does God answer Job's hope? By sending the Son to become a man. And the Son of God incarnate as the man Jesus Christ could go to the cross and he could lay one hand on the throne of God and he could lay one hand over all of humanity's sin. The Bible says he became sin for us and our God could put one hand upon the throne, one hand upon our sin and he could die to pay for the sins of the whole world. He he could have the same thoughts as God while at the same time dying for our sins. And he could do so because he was fully God and fully man. Jesus Christ might then make a judgment between God and man through his death and resurrection on the cross. He could be our arbitrator. He could come between us, being able to put one hand upon the throne of God and one hand upon man, and he could make a judgment between us that would be binding. And what was that judgment? It's summarized by the Apostle Peter in Acts chapter 10, verse 43. To Jesus Christ, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. This is the judgment of Christ. Jesus Christ is the arbitrator between the holiness of God and sinful humanity. And the prophets spoke of him because they were saved by him. And Peter saw him transfigured and worshipped him. And Christian friends, in the crucible of suffering, look to Jesus. Look to him with the eyes of faith. He is your gift in suffering. He is the gift that Job did not yet have. This is why we have a better covenant than Job. Because we have Jesus as a man. And Job did not yet know him as a man. Jesus is a gift to overcome suffering because all things are possible with God. Now, our Lord Jesus is not uncanny and alien to us. He is our friend. If you feel distance from God in your suffering, cry out with Jesus Christ, the words of Jesus Christ on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Christian friends, how do you know that you can say that? Because Jesus Christ said that for you. If you're afraid, join Jesus Christ in the garden and pray, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. When you're abandoned by your friends and your family, point to the church and say with Jesus Christ, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. We are not alone. And Jesus Christ has come to comfort us. Now we have seen Job suffer today. But Job did not know Jesus Christ of Nazareth as a man. But we do. Let Jesus be your comfort. Come to the mighty Gospels in the New Testament and get to know Jesus. 
Find your favorite gospel. Find the gospel that describes Jesus to you. And study it. Come to know Jesus. And then, and then pray to Him. Pray to His Father through the Spirit in the name of Jesus. So that you, become, you begin to know the personality of God. So that He will be a comfort to you. Many years ago, I, I had a friend who, who suffered from depression. And, and one of the things that I encouraged him to do was just to go to the zoo. Go to the zoo and see the personality of God. What kind of God makes a duckbill platypus and a polar bear and Russian bears and, and panda bears and hawks and slugs and all of these other things? And I think, what is it, 21 million kinds of beetles? An exuberant God, a happy God, a, a loving God. Draw near to God through Christ. Now, my non Christian friends, a, a brief word with you and for you. Bildad's words are ultimately true. Please hear them again. Such are the paths of all who forget God. The hope of the godless shall perish. His confidence is severed and his trust is a spider's web. He leans against his house, but it does not stand. He lays hold of it, but it does not endure. Non-Christians, I don't know how you're living right now. It, it may be that you're living in, in almost absolute and, and complete luxury without God. Your life may be easy. You may be healthy. You may have lots of kids and, and a happy marriage. You may also have a mixture of some easy and hard things and be godless. And your life might be almost absolute suffering and you've cursed God and you desire to die. I, I don't know where you're at. Yet when you die, the hope of of the godless shall perish. When you die, God will take away every good thing and he will even take away from you the possibility of hope. But there is another way. And that other way is that you can repent of your sins and trust in the Son of God. The, the Son of God can come beside you and he can put his hand on your shoulder and and his hand on the throne of God the Father and introduce you to God the Father and say, this is my friend. And you will be saved. Because you see, Jesus has made a judgment. This is the judgment. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. I know that in suffering, it gets darker and darker and darker. But what Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the whole Christian church wants you to hear is that you can love the light. You can come into the light. You can repent of your sins and trust in Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And that in a short time, Christ will return or he will call you home and there will be nothing but good things for you then. This is why Christ died on the cross. He died on the cross to save sinners like you and me. He died on the cross to save sinners like Bildad, self-confident, pompous jerks. And he died on the cross to save holy, righteous men like Job who followed God closely and suffered enormously. That's why the Bible teaches us and says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He loves all kinds of sinners. Won't you be one of the sinners that comes to Christ? Let's bow our heads and pray. Our Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that you are our arbitrator between God and man. We thank you that you have placed your hand upon the throne of God and that you have placed your hand upon us and you have said, this is my friend. We thank you for the judgment, Lord, that whosoever believes will be saved. And Lord, we pray that each and every person hearing these words today will be saved. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's close our service by singing together, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Thank you.